In 1929, an archaeological crew led by Sir Leonard Woolley discovered a harp and three lyres at the Royal Graves of Ur in modern-day Iraq. What Woolley's crew uncovered was the ritualistic suicide of the Sumerian Queen Puabi and her 68 servants, dating back to 2600 BC, which made the accompanying instruments among the oldest still in existence, one of which was said to have had a body lying on it with her hands over where the strings would have been. It's believed she played it until her death. The silver lyre now on display at the British Museum in London being in the best shape given its metal build, though, like the others, still unplayable. The remaining were divided between said institute and the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia, with the golden lyre to stay in the National Museum of Iraq in Baghdad, where it would be shared with hundreds of thousands of other artifacts from ancient Mesopotamia as well as Persia, each detailing the first few steps of mankind at the dawn of civilization in their own rich and plentiful ways. That is, until America invaded in 2003. It was one of several museums across the country to be looted amidst mass hysteria of the impending Iraq War, resulting in the theft and destruction of over 15,000 artifacts, only half of which have been retrieved to date. To lose one piece that's about uh, more, more than 5,000 years old, that was crafted by an Iraqi, by a Mesopotamian in this land, and we had it here and it was displayed in one of the galleries, and thousands and thousands of people used to come and see that piece. And now I believe one of these very important pieces, nobody will see them again. The damage was so severe the museum wouldn't officially reopen till 12 years later in 2015. This included the Golden Lyre of Ur, whose weak wooden frame was found shattered in the parking lot with the body stripped of its gold. The wood was recovered and is now kept in the museum's basement, hopefully to be reassembled one day. However, in 2004, a man named Andy Lowings came with the proposal to make an authentic, playable replica to take around the world and perhaps perform with. One made from the same regional materials as the original was. This required 75 kilograms of cedar wood transported from Baghdad to England by the Royal Air Force, 2 kilograms of bitumen mixed with beeswax from heat Iraq for the adhesive, mother of pearl shells from the shores of the Persian Gulf to make the eyes, strings made from a cow's stomach, and 2 thirds kilogram of 24 karat gold with a full year dedicated to crafting its new frame. And just as much time spent by countless painstaking artists to replicate the art designs around it, many of them working without pay, and some even contributing their own money to finish the project. You soon realize that it's a very, very long, tedious task, We've, even with modern tools. And how they did it back then in Mesopotamia, I just don't know. But certainly by doing it, you certainly learn a great deal about how the original people might have worked. And I've, I felt after some months that I really knew that person who had created that, um, that liar all those years ago. But with the liar finally completed years and years later, with Mr. Lowing successfully traveling the world to share its story, there was one final step that needed to be taken to record it. Steph Connor, a fellow musician like him, partnered with Andy to make an album of original music with this instrument. Entire songs adapted by Mesopotamian poetry and transcribed folk songs, with the lyrics sung in their native languages of Babylonian and Sumerian. Some of the earliest known languages, with only a few sung in English and Arabic, as well as borrowing its title The Flood from the very one described in the Epic of Gilgamesh. try to bring these old times to life to everybody. 
This is a, an instrument from before everything, from before Christianity, from before Judaism. This is an instrument that connects us all. And so nobody can have any uh, fault with us bringing it alive in, uh, and, to, and to show the uh, history of, of those ancient times. I can understand if someone has reservations with this album, since at the end of the day it's only a replica and not the real thing, and yet there's something about the legacy that comes with this instrument that I find so emotionally palpable. I've listened to it countless times, fully aware it's not the actual liar, and yet there's so much weight in the sound that it might as well be. I mean, you can't help but feel everything that's gone into it being made when you listen to it, or the significance of what it's imitating, or even the death that surrounds the original liar that this almost inherits. This isn't some cheap replica to throw in a knickknack store. This is respecting and admiring an instrument, a piece of art, that existed before the pyramids. There is a statement being made with this that I've been shocked hasn't gotten more attention. The Golden Lyre of Ore Project is one of the most unique I've come across in my life, and I commend each member for their dedication and craft in bringing this to us. The work, after all, speaks for itself. We feel that if that last player, who had her hand over it as she died in the grave, saw our modern lyre, we feel that she would say, that's the one. That's my lyre. Come sit closer.